may I have your attention? Um, I want to welcome you in Flushing on the 4th and uh, in the last Congress of the Safe Age Conference, Sustainable Aging Future Europe, today in Flushing and tomorrow in Middelburg. With the four partners since 2015, uh, it's Helsingborg in Sweden, Tampere in Finland, Foligno, Italy, and the Netherlands. We have made a view from different perspective to the care for the elderly people and make the home care sustainable for the nearest future. Today and tomorrow, we want to hear and discuss about developing tomorrow's home care and create a better and more functional home care in 2020. Instead of many differences between our four countries in systems and financing, we have lots of similarities. That makes the exchange during these two years of this European project so interesting. And thereby, we made friendship, which is worthwhile and makes us happy persons. Yesterday evening, there was a welcoming dinner with our international guests, and we listened to Up Dexter House. He has opened our minds and let us see why we, the blonde people in the north of Europe, are one of the happiest people, not only in Europe, but in the world. I hope the Italian delegation didn't have a bad night because of that point of view. <laughs> now we're going to look at the brand movie of our organization. I'm proud to say that our organization is plain tree, which means to have good care, a healing environment and a healthy organization. Let's have a look at the film. I think we made a nice program for two days. We found a person to lead us to the program, maintain the time and let us have discussion. He is described in the Dutch magazine as a bouncy ball because of his enormous energy. He performs many functions and he is professor in management and organization of the elderly care at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Dear guests, I want to introduce to you Robert Huisman. He will introduce himself and I want to give the microphone to you. Robert, Robert, the floor is yours. Great. Good morning to you all. It was a profile you did during all. framed me as a you will see that. Uh, zeg maar, dat niet waar is, Robert. Kom. Yeah. Is everyone here? Did you have a good night? Yeah. Where's Sweden then? Yeah, look at that. Oh, great. Welcome to the Netherlands. And Finland? In Finland, there, there. Oh. Ze zitten wel lekker bij elkaar. Dan moeten we dat niet door elkaar gaan gooien. Ja, ik moet het zeker. After a very long day. Welcome to the Netherlands. Great to have you. 
then of course Italy. Warm friends, where are you? Hi. <laughs> Would you love to join us in front? No. <laughs> we'll switch around during the days. So that's great. And there might be some folks from the Netherlands, perhaps. Yo. Morning, Netherlands. Great to have you all here. I'm uh, very inspired by the program and the, and the speakers we have. Where is the program? Do you have the program on sheet for me? No. Nope. Yes, you have. No, I don't. Yeah. No, I don't. Yes, you have. No. 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 You have a sheet. Yes. Yeah. No. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is what they call improvisation, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Three teams. We'll start with technology. It's all about sustainable health in the future. And Lucien, I uh, will introduce him shortly, will give us a, a brilliant lecture about new technologies. Imagine care for the elderly in 2030. That's your mindset for this morning. Elderly care, 2030. Only 13 years from now on, but what could change? What do we skip, get rid of, and what new things will come in? We care for our elderly, for ourselves perhaps, <laughs> at that time. You never know. And in the afternoon, the second half of the afternoon, because technology goes on after lunch with two other perfect examples of new technology, robots in care for the elderly, for instance. You will have a, an example of that. And in the afternoon, we'll, we'll go to the theme of participation and voluntary work. And we learned from up last night that those who give and participate in voluntary care are even happier than those who are not. <laughs> <laughs> that must be wrong. <laughs> that must be wrong. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's about the program. Along the way, you will find our friends. There at the side, they are. Agnes is there on the left hand. And Valerie at the right hand. She will uh, come to you with a camera. Perhaps some of you already were interviewed for one or two minutes. Um, and that's nice to, to just start off. Uh, Agnes, uh, you're going to, to bring something here to our mood board. You know about mood boards? Thank you, Mr. Robert. <laughs> a change. A change in the mood boards. During all the, the meetings, lectures and whatever, what are you going to do? I try to make some quick um, impressions about these days. And um, in combination with the movie um, Valerie is going to make, uh, we are com combining these things together with also the participation, I hope, from the people here. Great. So I think after two days, this wall will be changed in um, a powerful uh, combination of different thoughts, impressions, etc. The first thing you uh, put here is a quick sketch from the income tomorrow, of this morning in uh, the atrium here in Tereda. Yeah. Great. Okay. Visual reporters, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> already give them an hand. We'll see how things go. Take a look yourself during the days, that will be great. Did I introduce myself anymore? No. <laughs> Briefly, Robert, I live in Rotterdam. I hold the chair, I'm a professor in management organization of Care for the Elderly. And I lead a Dutch national program on dementia care to improve care for the elderly today and during 40 years ahead, bringing in new technologies which are already available. Uh, because we are in huge trouble for care for the elderly. Huge trouble. Changing demands of the population themselves. They are not that easy anymore. They have their own rights, lives, demands, wishes. And it's our role to, to give them the floor, to, to live their lives as long as <coughs> good as possible, even though they might lose their own powers to, to really activate themselves during the dementia progress. That's the real trick. Quality of life for people, even when they're heavily impaired, <coughs> socially, mentally, or physically. 
So uh, I'm in Vienna also, but I don't know anything about it. I was an economist for a while. I'm always curious about the evidence of <coughs> things you're doing. Is it really worthwhile our Europe to invest in new technologies? Does it pay off? It's an investment <coughs> and it should have some results. And it's the ratio between those, cost effectiveness, if you like, which I'm really interested in why you introduce new technologies in healthcare, but in a more agile way than we used to do. Working around short cycles to improve better type prototyping with the people instead of over their heads in real practice. Well, that's about also the, the attitude we share, Lucien. You are really one of the Dutch already international experts in innovation. Healthcare innovation. You are the founding director of Reshape. It's a uh, center of health and healthcare innovation at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, you're a well-known TEDcom speaker. You launched the TEDx in Maastricht in 2010, which was quite an endeavor. You can still see it. Do you follow TEDx? TED.com? <laughs> There's a whole world out there. <laughs> the whole world. He's a LinkedIn influencer. That's the status you have to earn because he's a connector between all different worlds, subworlds, bringing it together in new ways of thinking about health, healthcare, and innovation. He's also a faculty member of the Singularity University. Have you know learned a little bit more about that? And in the Silicon Valley, he's a faculty member of the Exponential Medicine USA. Remember the word exponential. Yeah, I think that will play a role in this lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, your first speaker of today, Michel van Erre. Thank you very much, Robert. With an introduction like that, I only can disappoint you today. So <laughs> I already disappointed you because I'm gray, not blonde. So um, Let me share you something about one of the mind bubbles that I have. I actually think that besides of all kinds of technology, there's a kind of climate problem. <clears throat> Not only in climate, as you see, but also in politics. We expect things to happen, and as we all see in, for instance, in the UK, when people wake up, something different happened than they expected. It. And even our friends in the United States at November 8th, at morning wake, saw something different than some of them had expected. And that's also one of the similarities that we have. We had some Dutch elections a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, and from my perspective, this went, wrong, uh, went in a good, uh, good direction. But the thing is that we kind of neglect all kinds of things that are happening within society. We know that they're happening, but we don't address them. We don't talk about them, we don't use them, and we actually don't work on them. And there was this great movie in 2004, which is called The Day After Tomorrow, when in a night, all of a sudden, the Ice Age came in. Still, people neglected it uh, up front. And that's exactly what I think that's happening right now. We do think that software is eating the world, and not only in economics, or in manufacturing, or in finance, but also in healthcare. And that kind of neglect, is spread it throughout healthcare. I was a couple of weeks ago invited in Basel in, at the uh, main office of one of the big pharma companies and they asked me to come and talk about a digital strategy. We're going to create a digital strategy. So this was my opening slide. Welcome in 2012. Because if you want to work on a digital strategy today, you will be running with that in five years from now, since that is the time that it's going to take you. So that's not a quick fix. Although everybody in the room is using digital technology on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, basis even, in the Netherlands, 93% of all people, young and old, are using electronic banking on a daily basis. Sometimes with some secondary aid, but still, they're using it. And that's the world that we live in, actually. And when I drove up to Vlissingen, I was surpassed by this great car, electric Tesla, zooming from, uh, near me at the left-hand side. At the same moment in time, and at the right-hand side, 
that was this gas station. And I thought, oh my god, what are these guys going to do when everybody stops driving electrically? Do these oil companies think about a new business model, about a new role that they have? And actually, they do. This is their answer, serving healthy, quote unquote, food. Where you, somewhere in the middle, can still pay for your gas, but still they're changing their model. And although we know that the world is changing fast, and we know that we will start driving autonomously with our cars, and at one point in time, we actually are not allowed to drive anymore. And my, our youngest is 18 years of age, just had his driver's license, and he will t share with his kids in a couple of years that at one point in his life, he needed to get a driver's license. And at the same moment in time, we also had some uh, road marks that are guiding us how to drive, but at that point in time, the car knows it better than we do, of course. And even Apple, one of the big corporates, is seeing a clear change in history because the departments that are working on their iPhones and their tablets and their laptops is completely being decreased because they said, this is end of life for these devices. We will start working with all kinds of different realities, like virtual reality, these huge glasses, augmented reality where there's a layer on top of the reality and then mixed reality where these things are mixed and you could all of a sudden be surfaced in a whole new world and walk through this room actually thinking that you're in on the beach for instance. Healthcare is the same. This is an example in one of the finalists of the XPRIZE for the medical tricorder. I think the medical tricorder some of you are in the age that remember that there was this um, uh, a Star Trek in the, uh, on the TVs where the uh, physician, I think it was Dr. McCoy, had this little device scrolled about the patient and know exactly what was happening. So there was a $10 million price issued in, uh, in the United States for that group that was able to put a physician in a box with at least nine diagnoses. So about 300 teams submitted uh, in doing that. And this is one of the finalists. And in this you can see that you can take your blood pressure, you can uh, uh, have a peek in the ear, lung uh, problems, uh, urine samples, blood samples. They claim to be able to run 19 diagnoses with this little system that costs about like 500 euros. From those 19, 10 already are scientifically validated and the rest is work in process. So that's what we're looking at. And when I, four years ago, I think five years ago actually, um, uh, started to work with a little strip to create uh, an EKG, not with the 12 lead EKG on the ER or in the cardiology department, but at the back end of my phone, my friend and professor of cardiology said, well, that's not going to happen. That is not accurate enough and it cannot be true that this works. So 15 minutes later, I was on the stretcher on this department connected to a 12 lead EKG and that little strip at the back end of my phone. And the best compliment you can get from a professor is that somebody said, well, it doesn't do bad, you know. <laughs> so this is four and a half years ago. Three weeks ago, in the news in the Netherlands, this little device creating a two lead EKG already have been done, 10 million EKGs already, has become insured healthcare, reimbursed healthcare for the five biggest healthcare insurance companies in the Netherlands within five years. So now these guys are working on the, the next step, which is the same technology, but now in the band of, for instance, an Apple Watch or from Google, whatever. By then being able to 24 seven track your EKG within a blink of an eye. And a couple of months ago, I, somebody gave me this business card that supposedly also was able to do the same. So let me be honest, that's, that's rubbish. The rest is scientifically validated, but trust me, within a year from now, that's becoming true. That's the pace that this technology is evolving. And we now see a lot of what I like to call first generation technology. Sometimes crappy, doesn't work always. It's not accurate enough, but these things are, running, are going very fast. This is one of the other examples. It's a, it's a patch. It's like this size. We can connect it to our chest. We've worked with it for, I think, like three years already. Five days, four or five days in a row, we're able to 24-7 monitor a patient remotely in the comfort of their own home 
in car, in the bus, in the plane, with nine vital signs. FDA approved, CE approved. Heart rate, respiration rate, temperature, in terms of measuring the patient remotely, um, posture, whether or not this, there's, fall, and there's fall detection in it as well. And again, also an EKG and also stress level. Um, is it going to cost like 50 bucks now? But at the moment in time with these things scale, that's like a $1 kind of thing. Just imagine what you could do within your own organization by using these kind of technologies to monitor somebody four or five days on a row. We're keeping like between 17, and I think Robert has the exact number, numbers, 17 and 20% of all patients in hospital for only one reason, to measure their temperature prior to discharging to their home, because we want to be sure that there's no kind of inflammation kind of thing going on. So it's the sole reason for that. With these kind of things, we could easily do that in a different way. So the point here is that at the right-hand side from spot measurement that we used to take, called somebody in for taking blood pressure or weight or whatever, will now go into an era where continuously monitoring is becoming possible. We gotta learn how to, that works. It's new, it's, like I said, sometimes crappy, and all kinds of technology is going to erupt. Interesting enough, we also could work with quote unquote big data. Everybody's talking about big data and nobody knows what it actually is because everybody has a different perspective on it. And one of the things we did in one of our research breakfasts is that our professor of internal medicine specialized in diabetes and our guy from cardiovascular said, what would happen if we would kind of impose two data sets from that thing and see what happens? So this is one of the graphs from this. What you can see here is the red line is the glucose level of a patient with diabetes. The blue line is the heart rate variability. So it's not the heartbeat, but the variability between the beats that is also a very good denominator of some things. This seems to prove, and we're working on this fiercely, that we're able with heart rate variability to predict what 30 minutes prior to somebody getting into a hypo, that this will be the case without picking needles in somebody's body. Just imagine what would be possible if this becomes true. Still, work in process, so I won't make the claim that it is true, but it's, it certainly looks like that. So only with good information, that's what we're saying. Secondly, another example that we in this case run with, together with Philips, there's 14,000 apps for diabetes out there. Some with a calorie counter, some with a bolus calculator and diaries and stuff like that. So we said, what would happen if we could combine four of them in one app? And that's what we did with 180 patients. <coughs> the article is submitted, so uh, it's preliminary a bit. What seems to happen is that the, uh, the HbA1c C is lower. So that's good. Patients have no more worries. Actually, based on the information what a lot of doctors thought, they would get more worried or stuff like that, and or maybe even more hypos during, uh, of the course, due to that course. None of that is true. So only by preventing inf providing information, things start to happen. And that's exactly where we think that we are right now, at the brink of these kind of things. And stuff is getting smaller, you, you will see me dagging around in my pocket sometimes to get something out. These are my earbuds that I use for the last two years. They're from Braggy, it's a Kickstarter campaign where you can crowdfund these kind of things and they make it possible for me to wirelessly listen to my music. Again, this is like two and a half years ago, it was not possible, so this was news. Meanwhile, when I would look up in the sky right now for two seconds, it would say, so you're on Vlissingen? Let me read you the weather report of Vlissingen, because it knows where I am. I can have a conference call with Robert prior to this meeting. But the interesting thing is that meanwhile, it measures my heart rate, oxygenation level, G-forces, the number of steps that I've been working on, my position. There's 128 sensors in these little chaps. So one could only wait till the moment in time when this become mainstream, because this was a Kickstarter campaign. So, September 8th, again in my pocket. Sometimes I look like a magician. Oh, something went wrong. No, you did not do anything. Okay. <laughs> Oops, so. so, September 
Uh, seventh, Apple introduced the Apple AirPods. Completely wireless, rechargeable, no sensors in it, at least none that they've disclosed to us. You never know with these guys, right? <laughs> but trust me, in version two and three, all of those sensors that I just mentioned will be in there. And about like 10 million people will start using those sensors on an everyday basis as normal, regular technology. And that will become medical devices hidden in consumer technology. And that's a bit of the tagline. And even as long as I mentioned Apple already, Apple also created Apple's Health Kit, which is able to measure all kinds of things. Who in the audience has an iPhone in the pocket? Well, that's a fair number, right? Who of you has switched off Apple's Health Kit? What? Apple has the biggest electronic medical record systems in the world right now. Because everybody that has an iPhone and has not switched off Apple's health kit is collecting data. The good news is it sits only on your iPhone. It's not in the cloud or whatever. But you could work with Apple's health kit and research kit to run studies with it. And that's exactly uh, what we've done. Since we were one of the two academic hospitals outside of the US to work first with the, with the system, and now streaming in like blood pressure and number of steps if the patient allows us directly into our electronic medical records without any intervention of somebody else. So we now can collect and also see data prior to the moment in time when somebody becomes a patient and still is a citizen. So the amount of data is changing. What this also brought is a new way of running research. And so sometimes I joke a bit that Apple is becoming an academic medical center which is somewhere in the comfort zone of Robert and me. Uh, and why is that they've issued this research kit and for instance, just to name one, one of the apps that they've created is in Parkinson's. And when they published the app where patients with Parkinson's can do all kinds of tests and give consent and everything that's needed for real scientific studies, within 48 hours, 18,000 patients were included in the study. I don't know about you guys, but in the Netherlands, <clears throat> Eight academical centers will need like five years to get 18,000 patients included in your studies. This is, again, this is Apple. This is not like. Yeah, phones start talking to you as well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, the problem with that system, however, is that you need to code, and we've created a shell around it and a program so researchers and patients can create their own research by drag and drop. So, at this very moment, since four weeks, Three patient unions are creating their own research with this system, igniting worldwide research with 700 million research devices being your phones. Again, so this is Apple. We're not transferring that as well to Android because we think it's needed. So everything I've shared with you up until now is true. The next slide is completely fantasized, my way, so I have to warn you. Although you might recognize this as the iTunes store, but there's a kind of new app at the left corner of it, and I am, I'll emphasize it a bit. I do think that within a couple of years from now, Apple or Google will issue for 99 euro cents a month an additional digital healthcare insurance policy, where you, 24 seven, can reach out to a Dutch speaking physician in Italy, Finland, Sweden, whatever, and based on the readings from your phone, get advice. If only 5% of everybody who owns an iPhone would do that, that would be a $1.8 billion market a year. This is one of the reasons why these corporates are heading for health and healthcare. And you also see different modalities in that, like this is an insurance company in the United States, Oscar. They said, let's, let's assume that the, uh, the fee for the insurance is 100 bucks, $100. And they would say, well, if we could give you this little Fitbit and you would start to wear it and share the data with us, you won't need to pay $100, you just paid 75. Fine. But well, we get your data. Which is fine for people who are well educated and have money enough. So there's a free will in that. But whenever you're lower educated, have multi problems and multi conditions, not so much money, when is the moment in time when the coin flips? from free will into I have to. 
So that's a very interesting ethical question. And although I'm very into technology, when somebody asks me, what should my son or daughter get to study? I would say, well, bring them into ethics because that's the job of the future, I'm sure of that. So what you see is that also all kinds of other technology, and I will give you a brief uh, uh, tour the horizon about that, like the blockchain is coming up also in healthcare. We did a proof of concept on the blockchain where access to a medication file is been done by your banking card with the random reader. And the reason for that is that all kinds of different systems are being created, which is multi-million dollar projects. And in the Netherlands, 93% of everyone is using this technology. It's in your pocket and you're using it on almost on a daily basis. So why invent something new, which we trust, obviously, because we trust our money to it. Secondly, you see that all this data has to not only been gathered, but also been processed. And one of the companies that's working fiercely on that is, uh, is IBM with Dr. Watson. There's, by the way, tons of Watsons out there, not from IBM already. But the basic process is that we will start to recognize patterns in data, patterns that we did not know of. Patterns like I showed you earlier on in terms of the glucose level combined with the heart rate variability. You will get step, step into the unknown unknown of data which might even completely upset our idea of the mechanisms of disease. And I really do think that this is also becoming true. This is the New York Stock Exchange in the mid-60s. 6,000 men, only men were working at the New York Stock Exchange by then, trading stocks and bonds verbally with all these. Uh, I, I never really understood how this worked with these guys with all kinds of different hats and colored coats and stuff like that. This is the same spot. 16 workstations running the same. Only 3% of all stocks and bonds are being traded verbally. The rest is done by algorithms. Still 6,000 people working at New York Stock Exchange, but now they're keeping those algorithms healthy, so it's a different role. It might be even different people. And I think the same will be true for healthcare. This is a ICU nurse in Phoenix, Arizona that I visited. And with her system, she's keeping an eye on 250 ICU patients in the region for 17 hospitals. One nurse, one system. Additionally, to the nurse and the physician on the spot. But in terms of bringing somebody extra in and bringing expertise, this is where it's happening. <coughs> That's also the reason why we're now creating a huge telemedicine and telehealth center. So telemedicine for us is on the ICU side. So it's real medicine. And telehealth is at the other side where consumer technology, but again, what's consumer technology in the future, is crafting towards being able to do things that we've never been able to do. And just to show you again how, sh how fast and small things are uh, becoming, uh, I brought you an ultrasound machine. You know ultrasound machines, right? Like this huge, so I got one in my pocket again. It's a bit like a magician again. Or something. <laughs> so this is the ultrasound of the future that we're able to do an ultrasound in the ambulance right now. Next step is in your own home. Data being processed, analyzed, not by a radiologist or echographist, but, but a system by an algorithm. Oh, huh. great when you talk about technology, right? <clears throat> so in the, uh, we're able to do these things in the, in the ambulance. So, and then the virtual assistants. We heard one on one of the iPhones uh, a, a bit earlier on. These things become more sophisticated ever more. Not only in terms of, as you can see in the middle, <clears throat> that they really look humanoid. But two weeks ago, I got an email message from MIT. <clears throat> They're testing a system that became, to me, as one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen in terms of reality. And I want to show and share this with you. Can you boost the sound a bit? Hello, my name is Nadia. I'm a virtual assistant and I'm here to help you. I'm not human, but I can make it easier for you and other NDIS users to get the information and help you need. You have more important things to do than wait on the phone, so I'm here to help whenever you need. I can hear you, and if you have a webcam, I can see you too. You can talk to me or type questions in the chat box, and I will talk back and write my own. 
So this is becoming creepy, hello. I think. Um, <laughs> hello. <laughs> She's persistent, like my wife, but. Um, <clears throat> don't tweet about this, please. <clears throat> I'm a serious problem right now. <clears throat> this system is being used in New Zealand for 150,000 people who are living assisted in rural areas to help them 24 seven. Combined with artificial intelligence, learning from every question and every answer that's been given. So that's where we're heading. And the other thing that we're heading is that you've seen that things become smaller and that as opposed to wearable technology will now go into our bodies and I coined this insidable because that's where we go. Where we can be able to measure stuff from the inside out. And the majority of the robots that I see within healthcare will be Robots without arms and legs, but will be in your blood vessels, for instance. Uh, or in terms of neural dust, this is work from Berkeley, University of Berkeley, that are able to sprinkle like very small computers on your brain, combined with a node connected to the cloud, let's call it the cloud, and being able to measure all kinds of things also again 24-7 and, and, uh, and uh, do different interventions based on that. So that's one of the reasons why we're now creating two big centers, one in terms of expertise on remote monitoring and the other one on AI and machine learning because we think that that's really the future. So if you step back a bit on some of the technology that I showed you, you can clearly see that stuff gets smaller, gets cheaper, gets delocalized and gets hidden in consumer technology as opposed to medical technology. And that's the way we are. So that's what's coming up. So now let's just see a bit how we run healthcare, yet still nowadays. This is the way that we do things. You have to take a day off to go to the hospital. You have to burn fossil fuels, find where the hospital is, find that last parking spot at the top level deck at the back end of it, rush to the department for your 10 a.m. appointment, two minutes prior to 10, you're at the desk, and the lady at the desk said, well, wait a minute, he's running late, just take a coffee. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? So at the moment of time when you grab your second cup of coffee, they start to call you in. And that's where, no matter which research that you look into, the eight minute visit starts. And at the end of the eight minute visit, again, we do the same stuff, backwards burning fossil fuels. Sometimes even to just take your blood pressure or your oxygenation level, or create a simple EKG, which we can do with these little chips for 200 bucks already. Standard technology. FDA approved, CE approved, scientifically approved, no problem. But still, we'll ask you to come to our hospital, or to the physician, as opposed to we coming up to you. Same goes for video conference. Who of you had a video call with this friend, family, colleague over the last, let's say, two weeks? Who of you have done this in the last year with his or her physician or nurse? Not professional. Look around. Technology that we use on an everyday basis is still not being used and implemented within healthcare. Although, and this is one of the calculations that we did for Radboud University Medical Center, if only 5% of all outpatient visits would run virtually in terms of video call, it would save us as much as 200 parking lots. That's a parking garage that we don't have to build. And still people say, well, the cost effectiveness of these kind of things, yes, if you only look, Robert, to the healthcare system, that's true. But once you start looking into safe labor in terms of macro, uh, 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 macroeconomic costs, that's... So what we think that is going to happen is that healthcare will shift from academical healthcare into top clinical healthcare, from top clinical into supermarkets, from supermarkets to the homes of people. That's what you also hear a lot, from hospital to home. And actually, I think that's halfway down. Nobody of you is at his own home. You're not even at your own work. But you still carry 24-7 disconnected device at elbow. <coughs> <coughs> Showtime, yeah. I think I should better stay over here. Um, so th this is going to be transferring not only to home, but uh, like I said, also into, into the phones of uh, people. Um, because that's what's happening. The majority of the supermarket chains are heading for healthcare. Walmart is the biggest retailer in the US. They want to become the number two healthcare player within 10 years from now in the US. And they're opening up 35 
clinics per day in their supermarkets right now. And these are clinics like somewhere in between the ER and the GP systems, just to give you an answer on that. And um, Virgin Care from Richard Branson, from the record company and the airliner, recently won a 750 million agreement from the UK NHS to deliver healthcare. So this is Virgin Care, stepping into our world. And that's something that we should realize, not only from a different perspective, and like Amazon is going to start same day delivery of pharmaceuticals and medications. And two weeks ago, I, was, I had the honor to present to the Belgian Association of Pharmacists, and somebody stood up and said, well, they don't have any clue about pharmacy, right? I said, yeah, that's sure. That's why they hire 200 of them. Because that's what's going on. They get, they get logistics, so the, uh, the other stuff you can, you can buy, let's call it like that. So what we really see is that there's delocalization on healthcare. And back in 2014, on request of my board, I calculated that about 70% of all the routine stuff that we do at Radboud in 2021, we won't no longer will be doing at our campus, but somewhere else in that chain that I just explained. So that there's all kinds of implications uh, in stuff that we do. And this is a running gig of me, it's a poll that I do. Uh, asking people now, like 1,400 people, 1,500 people already in it, where do you think that healthcare is going to be delivered in 10 years from now? It's shocking for some doctors, by the way. And, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the guy, right? <laughs> so I repeated the, the, um, the poll as well, also on Twitter, it's exactly the same. So the public already thinks of that it's completely delocalizing. But still, we keep track on the old systems into it. In a world that's connected, <laughs> connected 24 7. And although, and I'm getting a bit nearer to your uh, daily jobs, and although we know that the, uh, the, uh, the mean life, uh, the mean age is going to increase over the course, let's say, the next 15 years, the number of people of 65 and above will double, some of my colleagues would say, well, my patient population is not ready for these kind of things. And say, yes, yeah, sure. Since this is the new population that will be admitted to elderly homes, right? The first Rolling Stones fans are entering with a laptop computer as big as a fridge, by the way, but they're using technology, whether it be iPads or laptops or smartphones. The next generation that's coming up as well, within 15 years demanding the same amount of healthcare in terms of, uh, for, uh, for the elderly generation, is the Generation Y. Yeah, I think you're following. I, I got one of those kids, you know, like, halfway down. <laughs> and those from a completely different perspective in terms of obesity, obese, being obese, diabetes, and mental health problems. Um, so that's the challenge, and that's also my world. The challenge within, at one side, Radboud University Medical Center, like a mammoth trying to change would take you like one degree a year. And then the other end, in Silicon Valley, where things are changing so rapidly that I, when I sit in this little tube that we call airplanes back home, gosh, how are we going to achieve these kind of things? How in the world are we going to bring that into these things? And sometimes shocking helps. Like, every one of you have a, a photo camera and a calculator and all kinds of separate stuff, and now we got only one system in our pocket 24 seven, that's funny enough. And sometimes when you, go, and you are in the US, for instance, and you go head over to Starbucks, for instance, you can see this. Somebody's drinking his coffee with a virtual reality real, uh, glass, creating his own bubble. And he's nowhere else than in that bubble. But the most shocking one is at the right-hand side. The left-hand dog is a one-on-one -on -one clone of the dog at the right-hand right side. From one hair being taken away for $15,000, 300 dogs a month are being cloned in Korea. So this is also about ethics. <clears throat> we can talk for ages about ethics, but somewhere in the world, somebody's going to do this. And that's also how we have to operationalize these kind of things. And, and due to time, skip this. Uh, <clears throat> Let me bring this one. This is great, uh, talking about virtual reality. Did, uh, did you see the commercial of Samsung already? Yeah. If not, let's run it for a second. It's, it's too good. Bags last night and 
that everybody says it's not possible up until the moment in time when somebody does, right? So that's also why I took this little uh, picture. Uh, actually, it's a quote of Einstein who said, why do, are we still using old maps to explore new worlds? Because we think that the future will be the same as yesterday, but only a bit faster or only a bit differently. But it's a completely systems change that we really will have to work on from IP, from standardization and, and everything that goes with it. So it's, sometimes it's more like an awakening that you see things happening. For that reason, we said at Rodbout, we want to work on a new strategy. And the strategy is called Digital First, Physical Next. That's not to say that you're no longer welcome as physical at our campus, but it's more like we will offer you the same that we do, if it's possible, also in digital format. So it's you to choose, not us to choose for that. And that's an interesting perspective because we now have 1,000 beds, and we want to close down 500 of them. And that's by no means an academic measurement. It's more like if in 10 years from now, in those same beds, we will still treat the same patients, we have done something terribly wrong. So that's the way that we're trying to operationalize these kind of things. So it's not about translating these things. It's also to see that healthcare is globalizing. Because it's digitizing. When somebody has invented something in New Zealand, the next day it's on our doorstep. No longer as in the old days where it took months and months for these things. So for that, we've created this little center, which I call the Reship Center, to look ahead and see what's happening in 5, 10, and 25 years, to explore this and to research it, but also to brag about it, like in conferences like this. And from all the fuzzy signals that we see, we try to make sense and to help our colleagues into the next step. Sometimes in small projects, like in 30 days, from idea to actual realization, but not in terms of huge scalability to hundreds of thousands of people. It brought us also new ways to collaborate with great partners, and some of those are in this slide, where some of those are actually stepped up to us and said, well, we know that we have to change, we know that we can do it alone, so we should be running this together. That's also the same on innovation. I visited a lot of innovation centers worldwide, so I was in Finland, I was at Karolinska, I, was, I haven't been in Italy, so if somebody could invite me, please do. Uh, but there's all kinds of innovation centers that every, each and every one of them is fighting the HR department because we have to hire people in a different way. We strive with our lawyers in terms of IP kind of things that we want to invent something together and cannot buy it. So for that we really have to create a, a, a new funnel for that to try to explore these things and in the end being able to scale that. So we've divided our innovation process now in three different pillars. Shamelessly we stole from Peter Thiel from PayPal. The first part is from zero to one, something that has not been done ever worldwide. The next step, so that the next step will be from 0 0.8 to 1.2 in terms of now we make it shiny, now we make it work, now we make it safe and um, also a good business case underneath it, and then the next step will be the scalability, and that's on a worldwide perspective. This goes with failing. There's no such thing as a 100% uh, guarantee in terms of innovation. Never. You have to fail on that. And the only thing I'll put the video in the slides, uh, just so you, you know that, is that Astro Teller is the chief of Google X. And Google X is the group at Google that created the autonomously driving car and the Google glasses and the, um, the contact lenses and stuff like that. They actually have a strategy to promote people who fail even faster than the ones that will succeed. Because they say we learn more about our failures than a success. 
And that's not something that is incorporated in the way that we do these kind of things yet. So it's the same like in the, uh, for instance, the, the iPhone moment. And some of you remember that what happened when the iPhone was introduced like 10 years ago. At first there were not many apps. And then the, uh, the, the antenna was kind of crappy. And everybody would say, well, this is not good. And everybody was, was complaining about it and it's not good. And then Samsung did, did something new and Nokia. And then all of a sudden everything started to work. And then in an exponential phase, things start to work. And we all know what happened with Apple and with the iPhone, how it changed society. And I really do think that within healthcare, that's where we are right now, on the brink of the next phase. From first generation projects and, and, and products will now go into the next ones that you can tangibly use for it. And I think that's a very interesting thing to do. And actually this morning at 10 a.m., we launched the first ever health innovation school in the Netherlands. Together with the Ministry of Health and our Reship Center, we've created a curriculum to teach our new leaders in healthcare from government, insurance companies, healthcare institutions, and, and others, how to innovate and how to create a community together with your targeted group that might be patients, clients, uh, family, informal care, and everything that you have in that. And it also, by the way, starts always with coffee. Because that's the one thing that we do in the Netherlands correctly. I think we're always talking about coffee. If I cannot drink a good cup of coffee together with you, there's no way that we can collaborate. That's one of the things that we see. So I bought the best coffee machine that money can buy, and I put it at my office. So whenever you're in near Nijmegen, you come visit us. We kind of hacked an old neurosurgical department where this coffee machine is, and everybody's coming to steal coffee. And at that coffee machine, the best and biggest and greatest projects have been emerged. Because there's a low threshold opportunity for that. So whenever you want to run into those kind of things, buy, be sure to buy the first coffee. And actually, when uh, Fer and Jan asked me to come over and present, I thought of just presenting one slide, which is this one. No, it's not the Japanese flag. It's the one hour that I stole from Sarah Rierkare, a good friend of mine from Sweden, suffers from Parkinson's disease, and she has a great graphic, and that's this one. It's the one hour a year that she visits her neurologist, and the other 8,765 hours she's on her own. And she says, why do I have to comply to every standard in healthcare and make myself available and do everything the way you want it to do, and the rest of the time I'm on my own. And we often talk about patient journeys when we try to figure out what is the journey that a patient runs to during his illness. And as part of that, you could see what the institution journey is. So what of their patient life is what we do within our institution. And within that institution, you even could also look into <laughs> and what is the part of that specific physician for instance. But there's another one that we kind of neglect. And that's the life journey. What's the life, what happened in the life of that patient that makes the choices that they make right now? And that's something that we really have to ask. So what we did is that we started not, no longer to innovate for patients or on behalf of patients. We started to innovate together with patients. And now we're in the next phase where we say, no, no. We'll put some of the technology at the table. We'll step aside and we just watch what happens. And we bring the whole system in the room. So no longer only with physicians and nurses to run these things. No, everyone in the room, insurance companies, industry, professionals, families, peers, and maybe even people from work, if they can be helpful. And that brings a whole new dynamic. And we've called that system and also the center that we created for that, the Reship Center for European Healthcare Design. And the reason for European is that the systems in the US are completely different. So it's not like a European center, it's more like the European lens that we put on it. And our friends from Salesforce and Creativity and also uh, Stichting Icone, Foundation of Patient uh, Representatives and Novartis Patients Academy are helping us. So these people represent 5 million patients that we have access to. And we're now running some trials on that and it brings enormous, tremendous energy back to the table and that they're also being heard. So what we're trying to achieve now on a data level is that it should be a constitutional right to have to have access to it. And in the Netherlands there's a law that you can get your file. But that, has to, that, that brings you to go to the healthcare institution, ask for your file, and somebody would look you in the eye and say, well, wait a minute, I'll get the doctor. I said, no, no, 
I don't want to have the doctor, I just want to have my file and you have to actually have to pay for it. The way we handle these things in healthcare is the same as if you would step up to your bank office and go to the front clerk and would say, I want to have my bank statement. And somebody would say, no, 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 no. You cannot handle that data, no. We're, we're watching your back, no worries. This is going great. That's the way that we handle it in healthcare. We, and I really think that we should not do that. With all the technology that I showed you, we'll, we'll, I think we'll go into the next era where we will be present at the moment in time when somebody gets sick based on all the centering. Secondly, because the patient slash citizen will create more data themselves than we have as healthcare professionals, we have to take a subscription on their data as opposed to the other way around. This is a shift of power that is going to occur in the next five years, massively. Also with all the ecosystems that are coming in. So one of the things that I would like to advise also governments is that no longer to pay for healthcare interventions that are not standardized delivered on data level. And still we're financing all kinds of projects that do not comply to the standards that we've agreed on. And that makes it always that things stay separately and we even call it differently like in e-health and mobile health. And so if you, start, if you keep doing that, I really think that we should make that into a digital healthcare. If we don't do that, it's kind of all these little separate systems keep surrounding like a planet, surround the healthcare needed for the patients themselves. It never gets an integral part of it. And, that we, and we really should fix that. We could take an example of some of the stuff that's happening in the US. Not all that's happening in the US, by the way. But um, For instance, Kaiser Permanente is one of the biggest healthcare in, uh, institutions in the US. They're all insurance company and healthcare institution. And the CEO of them, Bernard Tyson, says, we, uh, they got 11 million members, to give you a bit of a perspective. And over 6 million of them, on a yearly basis, already do everything through e-visions, almost everything. So that's like 52% of it. And based on the science, he literally says, I don't need any science anymore, Rob. Because if the more than half of my patient population is using this, to me, that's my science. And sure enough, he's running trials and stuff like that. But it's more like, sometimes you don't need proof when you see this from distance that this already works. And by the way, the science part of all these kind of things, like in digital health and e-health and everything that's going on, is exploding right now. These are the numbers from 2015. We've already had a small peak on 2016. Not everything is in yet. It's completely going through the roof. Good studies, bad studies, positive ones, negative ones. So this is being fulfilled. What we look, would like to do and prevent with digital health is that we would go into this. So this is not what we want to have. Okay, let's have a you're not looking at me. Hmm? You said let's have a look at you, but you're not looking at me. I am examining you. On your computer? Um, it's the only way to prove that you've been seen. You're not looking at me to prove you're looking at me? Well, I... Yes. Smoker? No. Hmm. So that's not what we, that, that's the wrong alley, of course. So if we were able to use technology in a way that we can uh, elaborate and emphasize the power of the human touch, that's where things get uh, really in the good perspective. So what we like to achieve is that we will go into an experience-driven healthcare system based on science, of course, where the patient's family and formal care themselves have a choice. And in this world, 2017, and the perspective and the lens is 20, uh, 2030, there's tons of digital technology being available. Some of that you can even not imagine of, and we'll talk about that later in the workshop. So wrapping up a bit, I think that there's four pillars in this discussion. And I always talk about my four Ds. The first one is that healthcare is becoming delocalized. We clearly are going to do stuff on a different place than we're doing it right now. Secondly, Healthcare is becoming democratized based on data. In the same way that we've seen in travel industry, that at the moment in time when we get access to how these hotels and travel were, we started to work completely autonomously and made different choices. Thirdly, it's about digital. And not only from a technical perspective, but at one minute prior to 10 a.m., something was not possible, and all of a sudden somebody in India published a press statement, and now your work and your world as dermatologists changed with the blink of an eye. And the fourth D is about money, dollars. Huge investments are needed to get sustainable systems 
secure systems up and running. And that's why big corporates like Philips and Apple and other ones are heavily invested tens, hundreds of millions in frameworks that they want to sell in the end of the day to citizens, uh, institutions and patients, of course. So with all that, you could argue whether you should be smart. And I don't think that you need to be smart. You need to be adaptive, like Darwin already said. Uh, a couple of years ago that it's not the smartest one, but the one that adapts the best. So, again, let's not neglect everything that's happening right now. I would like to close with a small video of the most innovative species in the world. And you must have known that those were penguins. You'll face a social phenomenon in this video. At the right hand side you see a group that's being confronted with an innovation being the rope. And trust me, within like 10 seconds in the video, you will start recognizing colleagues of yours. <laughs> you see what happens, they are confronted with the innovation, some of those will start to think about what to do, others think, what the heck, let's go for it. <laughs> we'll see what happens at the other side. Again, there's some quarrel in the group, people looking away, hoping that tomorrow it's gone when I wake up. <laughs> Completely defacing reality, and some again think, well, let's see what happens. Bruises, brushing off, these kind of things. And again, you see the resistance building up in the group at the point in time, even when, again, somebody breaks through the lines, even the unions will step up. And let's go out there, let's save our jobs and stuff like that. And then you will see a typical Dutch phenomenon. At the moment in time, when again somebody breaks through the lines, the right hand group say, well, well that's it, let's have some coffee. <laughs> So please, let's all try to help that this is not the case in the end of the day and that we will have a sustainable healthcare system where it's fun to work, where it's great healthcare and a high quality to achieve for each and every one in every spot and in every moment in time of your life. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. For these, but don't forget other these like denial. Mm -hmm. Data, 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 data. <laughs> I have a uh, you, you said a third one. Digital first and physical next. That was an intriguing one. Because in elderly care, perhaps it's the true connection from person to person which helps their quality of life. I think some people might have thought about this. Well, I can imagine that. On the other hand, if you have if you're able to run routines digitally, yeah. that you have a choice to do and not have to go into the hospital being brought by your son or daughter or whatever and taking quality time for that, that also could be an interesting one. Our mission is to create a choice for people. Now there's no choice. You have to come to the clinic. Okay. Right. There is some room for questions, if you like. I don't know if there's Christina in the room. Yeah, Christina. Yeah, Christina. Yeah, Christina. Yeah, Christina. Yeah, Christina. Yeah, Christina. <laughs> Um, I want to ask the, about the technology and uh, different kind of apps. Uh, we're coming from Finland, and the uh, healthcare system is uh, state and all public fu publicly funded and publicly led. And, and if people have uh, several uh, apps and, and several uh, uh, products, let's say from Apple or Samsung or Android. Uh, uh, devices. How will this uh, this kind of uh, well, all the uh, information can be uh, kind of a control, or is it is it uh, needed to be controlled if, if the the uh, uh, public service is still providing the basis of the service? Nico, thank you for this excellent question. Yeah. Government-controlled healthcare system. What about ethics and control? Basically. Yeah. Well. First of all, you can neglect everything that's happening outside. So if you as a governor would say, well, that's not our call, don't think that it's not going to happen. It sounds, is going to happen. Sounds a bit like the Finnish answer right now. I know. <laughs> well, welcome into my world as well, by the way. So, so that, that's something that a lot of people think that's happening. The other thing is that with the huge investments that corporates are making, they know how to create a user experience. So that's why we all carry smartphones in our pocket and not the old fashioned things that we have. So what is going to happen right now is that you as a government could uh, take the chance actually and say, well, these are the apps and these are the systems that we are, think that are compliant. 
that we connect to our healthcare systems and data systems as a government and making sure that that's possible. But the, the thing is that now the majority of the governments clearly neglect these kinds of developments. And they say we should tender and we don't want to buy stuff from Apple or from Philips or whatever. And in the meantime, the patient is creating their own ecosystem. Like I said, the biggest electronic health system in the, in, in the world is Apple right now. So at one point in time, they have created the de facto standard. And it's basically a bit like what the guys from Microsoft did, I think like, it sounds like 60 years ago, but that's not true. The de facto standard within accounting is Excel. By no means a program that you will need to work in your company does not at least work or import or export an Excel file. So an outside company created the de facto standard and that's exactly what Apple and Google and Philips are doing at the outside. So as a government you should really address that, start collaborating with these guys because they will run it anyway. That's a great innovation lesson, Lucian. Standards come from outside your own sector. Walmart in consumer market. Go back in history. Each and every standard is not being issued from the uh, uh, from the sector itself. If you run back through it, even the quality standards that we use within healthcare, value-based healthcare, just as an example, complete that. Michael Porter did not start with his work within healthcare. It's completely from the outside in. Thank you. Yes. Great new question from Britt Marie. Hi, I'm from Sweden. It's a bit of an abstract question, maybe, but I'm thinking we're talking apps, we're talking digital world, when we really should be talking uh, machine learning and mediated reality. And if you would, yes, predict when it would actually be really running, when, when we will be really running healthcare with mediated reality on short basis, on broad basis. How long would that take you to practice? Well, that's a good question. Um, f first of all, let me address what Klaus Schwab, who's the chairman of the World Economic Forum, states. He says, we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. Steam engine, mass production, internet, and now internet of things. And the most important message that he sends out is that now innovation and developments are accumulating. So based on the new innovation that we have right now, all of a sudden we can do things that we couldn't do, like three months ago. So this will create an exponential curve in some of the developments. So that, that, that's one. Um, then back to healthcare in terms of the system that we have is highly regulated and completely risk adverse. So before the majority of the physicians and even governments like the gentleman back there uh, already said it, are going to step into these kind of things that will take us a generation I think. Although the technology will be present and the biggest worry that I have and already see in some places in the world is that there's going to be a new divide. Well, people will start using that and buying that themselves. I now clearly see some people in the baby boomer generation that have their savings because they wanted to go on a cruise or a second home or whatever. They're now starting to buy comfort to run their own healthcare. And that is from all kinds of also uh, 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 societal perspective, an interesting one to, to see what that will bring. So at one point, people will do this, will start using it if they have the money for it and, and also the, the guts to do it. And at the other one, uh, it will take uh, at least a generation, I think. Let's face it, the, the doctors that we train. We've changed the curriculum for med students in 2015 <laughs> at Rundgaard. So it will take them like seven years to graduate. Then they first have to work. We want to have a day off as well, right? So, so before they got any authority, we we're like 15 years into the game. Uh, so I, I would have loved to give you a different answer, and I'm a very optimistic kind of guy in and this. I would have liked to be in the business while it happens, but I guess yeah. I'm being retired in this. <laughs> yeah, or you're in that different group. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Yeah. One last question, perhaps? Yes. Well, that's at the back. That's what you make to your 10,000 steps, Robert. This is our fourth year uh, nerve student from yesterday evening again. Welcome back to this group. Hi, uh, me. I have a question about uh, we start working in a year from now. But how will our work look in maybe 30 years? Because 
like all the uh, simple uh, uh, blood pressure, all those things. It was your work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so there's good news. Um, we all know that um, healthcare demand is going to double over the next 15 years. And probably we have to run that healthcare within the same budget, if not a decreased budget. So we have to come up with smart solutions. And although you might like to run blood pressure measurements, I also could think that that's a routine that you'd rather be talking to your patient as opposed to run these routines. <coughs> So what you will see is that the data will come from outside in, will become automatically sent into these kind of things, giving you at one end the opportunity to treat more patients and to have more attention for your patients. That if everything goes well. We remember your photograph of a nurse running their station with 250 yeah. patients, you said? Yeah. Would you imagine yourself sitting in a chair with all those screens before your head? And no. Why not? So. Now, we have a lot of internships, and I like the contact with people and helping people, and it's... You want physical contact? Really. Yes, yes, maybe that's, that's true, talk to people, and I like that very so much, not, and that's why I'm going to be a nurse, I hope, and not to be... We need great nurses, yes. please do. <laughs> well, so the other thing is that just imagine yourself like 35 years in the job suffering from back pain, not being able to get a patient out of his bed, and then have the opportunity to, during your rehabilitation, to be able to run it like this, as opposed to sitting at your couch at home, not doing anything. So that's also some of the things that we have to juggle in terms of what opportunities will, be, will, will there be. And also there will be people choosing for this that would say, this is what I want to do. I want to deliver healthcare on a global level because this also brings the opportunity to uh, get more into global healthcare. In the next, I think like five years, 10 billion people will come online. Just imagine not only the workforce and also the thought force, but also the way we can deliver global health to those rural areas that now suffer from no internet, but as you might have seen, there's all kinds of companies bringing internet in sub subspace to have every inch of the world covered with internet. So that's also one of the things that we're on. There will be more time in a quarter of an hour in our workshop, but there's a final question here in the plenary session for Björn Falkenstrom. Um, in the near world, the digital world, will there happen a decrease of your thinking? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, so, I kind of have two perspectives on that. Uh, will there be an increase of healthcare due to digital demand? Um, at first, yes, there will be. Because we will have all kinds of opportunities and we will act on that. Like every physician and every nurse will, will, uh, will be working on that. Secondly, just like in, for instance, the ICU, the signal noise ratio based on machine learning, like uh, the lady in front just also said, will give us the opportunity to see on what data we should interact on what not. The third thing that's happening is that due to the fact that we're able to continuously start monitoring people, we can keep people out of a life event, like it be a heart attack or exacerbation of a COPD or whatever. So prior to the moment that there's really a life event, we can take action. So that could even decrease the amount of cost needed for that. But again, that's a hypothesis. We're writing this book as, we, as of now. It brings all kinds of new opportunities. And like I said, it's interconnected in all kinds of ways. There's a lot that we don't know yet. The only thing we know is that it's a chance. It's an opportunity. And if we would look away, somebody else is clearly going to do that. And there will, by the way, there were crooks in the Middle Ages. And there will also be crooks in the future. Somebody's going to work on this. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, great. That was the starting of our conference. Uh, we'll have a coffee break now. Please uh, go back to the, the corner where you had your coffee when you started. And from there on, we go to the left, to the other corridor, to the multifunctional rooms, and in this organization. And there we'll have a workshop with the chef. And that's where your group number is relevant. Go to table five room group, and we'll start there in ten minutes. So it's a ten. short bio break. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We're working quite hard, but uh, it's tempting to get all your post-its in one Wordle cloud. 
we manage still question two, so we'll get, we do a quick wrap up from question one, just to get a teaser for you with uh, Lucien. And afterwards you will get all the input and his slides, so then you can uh, really think it over when you're back home, <laughs> uh, have further discussions. <coughs> and the end version of the World Cloud will be this afternoon. So then uh, we have all the input together shared in our cloud for the future. So the objective of the can the microphone a bit louder? So the objective of the of the world is not to be uh, extensively complete or whatever. It's more like these are the words that you guys have been talking about. And the more than, uh, a word has been used, the bigger it pops up. So if everything goes well, patients or clients should be in there huge. I don't know if that is the case, but we'll see. Uh, other than that, with the whole document, like Robert said, you can dive into the deep. And with the people that we've been collecting the post-its, it's unbelievable interesting to see what kind of ideas that you came up with. And, uh, and also how this really could play into also future policies. Right? Lucien, uh, just uh, one uh, me meta question perhaps. How Meta question, yeah. How, how would average was our work here? Is it that difficult to think about 2030, 2050? <coughs> One person at my table said, I couldn't imagine the iPad 10 years ago. Now you ask me to think about 2050. Yeah. My gosh. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> th th this is an, uh, 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 an, an example of an exercise that makes you not only wonder how the world would look like, but the thing that you see clearly happening, and I've seen it happen in some of the tables as well, that at first you think like it's like today and a bit faster and a bit cheaper and a bit... Smaller. Just incremental things, yeah. And then all of a sudden you say, well, wait a minute, so this is 2050. So 13 years and then uh, 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 from 2030, even further on, you see that you cannot predict it. This is also the, uh, the, the, the bugle that people in government suffer from. It's very hard to predict these kind of things. You could create scenarios, you could take predictions and, and no. expectations of it, but they're, up until now they almost never have been met in terms of the timing no. and also the implication of it. And one of the people that's working in this area is, Clay, is Ray Kurzweil, he's also the writer and one of the, uh, the uh, founders of Singularity University. And he says by 2045 we will connect our brain to a hard disk and we will live forever because our brain will live forever and that's the way that works. Whether or not that's true, that guy since, 20, uh, since 1960 is predicting every year how things run and he has a, a margin of like 2% right or wrong. Oh, so, that's a brilliant man. Well, <laughs> that's why he's the innovation chief at Google and got all kinds of lifetime achievement awards, but it's more like to predict the future is not no. possible anymore. No. It's, okay. uh, so, so that, that's, I, I think also... That Here's our first uh, world of cloud of question one. What pops up is, uh, is old people, elderly, diseases. What do you see, Lucien? Well, for, uh, to start with people, I think that's the good <laughs> thing. That's, uh, that's, that's a good thing to see, uh, of course. Uh, one of the other things, besides of elderly and medical, I think this was the discussion also on some of the tables. Is this possible? Can it be true that this will be an option unto it? And that's one of the things that we see at least, and this is not happening in Finland, and it's not happening in Sweden or in Italy, it's only happening in Nijmegen. We only see the barriers. We only see why things not are yeah. possible and not why they are possible. And uh, so I'm always lucky when I can see that something like what like can uh, is, is in it. And I think that's very, uh, very needed for it. And close. Close. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And, and will. There's a will here. That's yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So it's not only fear, but also something to imagine. Yeah. So Nepal. Who talked about Nepal? <laughs> I did. He did. <laughs> His figures. <laughs> oh God, I don't even remember what I said. Oh, I think I said something about uh, me traveling with my my mediated uh, healthcare assistance to Naples or something like that. Okay. Well, get your quality of life. Or yeah. <laughs> okay. So the chip we've heard about the chip uh, uh, earlier on. 
the reality of it. Well, again, I think th this is only a bit like an appetizer, and I would encourage you to, once you've got the document later on, to when you're in a, in a flight or a train or on your whatever, just go through it and try to take messages out of that uh, to you and try to translate it to your everyday work. And Had you the document on the screen? What I try to do is that I try to translate it to what can I do with this on Monday morning at the church. Not to picture it too much for the work. So to finalize this, any observations of this uh, workshop which you want to share with us or with Lucien? He's still with us, but we're nearing the end of the, the morning sessions. Any observations? Yeah, great. I'll come to you. <laughs> it wasn't an observation, more a question to you. What do you see as the biggest obstacle or the greater forces against Digitalizing uh, health in the future. What are the big whys? We're not there yet. Or the big whys? Or the big barriers. reasons or barriers or forces against not. Two letters. We. We. We are. <laughs> um, technology is not the problem. There are no. still, there's, there's still problems, there are still issues, but those will be solved. Secondly, systems will change if we want it to. And I just had a chat with Sorry. one of your colleagues about how governments are reflecting to this. Don't expect governments to be ahead of the market, because they can't. We are the government and we not only choose them. More or less. And, uh, so we have to fix these things. The systems will follow in the end of the day. But the biggest hurdle and the problem is in us. You've been trained, or I've been trained for like 17 years to become a medical specialist. And then all of a sudden somebody steps up, steps up and says, hey, I got an app for that, you know. So that's, that's tough. That's more about the behavioral change than about the possibilities that technology... And what's behind that? Is that fear for unknown risks or...? Well, I think ever since humankind uh, started to exist, we were guided by fear. By animals. Fly or free. Yeah. Fight, yeah. That fear is natural behavior. And as long as you don't know what is behind that door that we're talking about, that's where you start to work in a different system. Second to that, and that's specific for healthcare and some, also some other industries, we have created a system that's completely risk adverse. And it should. In terms of patient care, it should. But every innovation project that we run is completely get medicalized, although 90% of the whole thing is just logistics. And all of a sudden, everything should be met in the same standards for medical. And so we should break these kind of things up. And uh, so what is, what's interesting to see is that I, I, I have the luxury to see all our new med students when they come in as freshmen every year, so like 450 of them. And the first course that they get is also for me. And they're great people. And they're very into these kind of things. 12 weeks after, I see them again, different people. Completely rewired by my colleagues. That's well, that's great, but that's not how we run healthcare right now, you know. So, and then they say, well, who to choose for that? So, this is also in education. And that's why I said earlier on, it might take a generation. Although I hope it not. Interesting enough, at our third question for new jobs and ab abolished jobs, one of the people at my table said the medical schools will be abolished. I can imagine that. <laughs> but, the, but again, so medical, training, oh, medical training always will be needed. Um, one of the jobs that somebody in a different workshop brought up was that we need a patient robot trainer. So this is a patient that trains Based the robot the to operationalize. Okay. Just think of that. So <laughs> it's, it's like flipping the coin yeah. around. So training always will be needed, and, 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 and doctors always will be needed. But the things that they do will be different. Um, that's by the way, some people think that that's a shift that's new, but it's not new. I think that some of us remember what happened in the mid 70s when the pregnancy predictions gone out of the doctor's office into the pharmacist. So that was real resistance because false positives and cannot be true and stuff like that. Go figure. That's that's the new normal. <laughs> so it's not it's not something that's new. Great ending words. Is it? I had to new normal. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank this brilliant man.
inspiring and with, with thoughts we are <laughs> struggling with, but also tempting to try. Thank you very much, Lucien van Engen. <laughs> Of course, some presents. This basket contains typical products from this region, this province, Zealand. So that's for you. Thank you. And the bridge of these products is for yourselves. You have seen perhaps that little place at the coffee corner? Two old men. <laughs> have you seen them? Have you noticed them? Do they want them, you to call them old men? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> They are also from a very typical Zealand product. You can try yourselves in three different flavors, butterscotch. That's typical also for this region. Feel free to take anything. It's there for you and enjoy your lunch. And we will be back at a quarter past one. Thank you very much.